All right, hey, hey, y'all. We're going to continue on our talk of uh, Baudrillard's uh, symbolic exchange in death, moving into specifically the discussion of the latter part, death. So while this is, will be the third part that I've done on this book, it'll, we'll actually be moving into the fifth chapter, titled Political Economy and Death. Specifically, it starts with the subchapter, the subtitle, uh, titled The Ex Extradition of the Dead. So we start out by saying that as soon as savages began to call men only those who were members of their tribe, the definition of the human was considerably enlarged. Go on a little bit. This is because the human is from the outset the institution of its structural double, the inhuman. So Baudrillard here is working within this sort of dichotomous uh, logic. You know, we can think of the um, uh, Derrida in this way. Um, it's not necessarily what the essence of any given thing is, or if we think of a circle where every point on the circle is equidistant from a center, it is a center neither predicated or located within the circle, but is actually found outside the circle. How the possibility of one's, the condition of one's possibility is predicated not on its essence, but precisely on what is exterior to it, at least in, in part. So what are your things about the human in those terms? The human comes to be classified as such, not necessarily because of its humanness, right? You know, we can think of Foucault and the order of things for this, this discussion a little bit more in depth, but thinking about the human as being a new category, being something that developed in the 19th century, something that came into fruition in response or as a consequence of the order of things. So and this reminds me, I think of, um, there's a new book out by Roberto Colasso that hasn't been translated yet, so I'm going off of the uh, abstract that, um, what is it called, this, I think it's translated, it hasn't been translated, but Google Translate translates it as such, uh, translated as The Celestial Hunter, I think, um, I think it came out in 2016, where the abstract says that, and this guy's really brilliant, Roberto Colasso, like, go look him up. Um, but he says that, in this abstract, that when humans came in contact with other humans, you know, the time, at a time when leaving the boundaries of one's settlement r really meant mystery, right? What, what lied beyond that? What lay beyond that? Uh, there wasn't, like, an, uh, an established category of the human. So when a human, or when a person, encountered another human, they didn't know who they were dealing with. They didn't know if they were dealing with gods, with an animal, with lords. They had no idea. So, this, you know, I use this example to kind of illustrate this, this idea. And in, in, a, in a sense, Baudrillard would see that as being, given what I just read from him here, um, a condition for the possibility of that becoming human, if you will precisely by having an outside. Now, this is, today we can think of this in relation to, you know, animals, think of this in relation to other broad categories, like trees or whatever, that come to embody or represent, totalize, if you will, things in the world, which is just, you know, a convenient way for us to engage in dialogue about those things. So the implication of this is as follows. So this is all it is. The progress of humanity and culture are simply the chain of discriminations with which to brand others with inhumanity and therefore with nullity. Which is, you know, I think it holds a lot of weight, uh, especially if we think of, you know, our relationship to animals. And that is certainly starting to be questioned now, or has been questioned over the past uh, few years, uh, the sort of privileging of the human position over that of the animal position. You know, like post-human stuff and, and Haraway and all that for, for this discussion. However, Baudrillard takes this to think about racism, where he says that racism is modern. He goes on to say then that previous races or cultures, cultures were ignored or eliminated, but never under the sign of a universal reason. 
So again, we're, we're really, it's really important to come out of Foucault for this, or to read in this a lot of Foucault. Now, the hardcore Baudrillard people would probably have a big problem with me saying that, but I'm, I'm currently working through the, um, the order of things, and uh, it's very clear that Baudrillard read that. In fact, it's almost intellectually dishonest to say otherwise, but this idea of universal reason, I think of, quite simply, um, the order of things, just just order in itself, how things were brought into a taxonomia, mathesis, or, or uh, one of those cr uh, crucial terms in Foucault's book, but at, at a time when the eradication of other people, cultures, settlements, or whatever, uh, it was predicated more in accordance with the example I gave earlier with Colasso, where the people didn't know what they were dealing with, where there was an immediately an, an immediate threat felt precisely because they didn't know if they were dealing with animals or gods or whatever. Whatever they could do to survive was really what was necessary. Whereas racism, the institutional formation of it, is something that can only exist once we've established these kind of totalizing systems. In this case, for Baudrillard, universal reason, or the thing that can establish this broad category of, you know, whiteness, blackness, you know, what have you, of, of men, of women, and then those things come to represent an entire whole from which uh, the only way to classify and to designate those things is by establishing a, a split from others, to say, I am this because I am not that, and of course, we're going to open up the domain, open up the possibility for a sort, sort of hierarchization. You know, the intensity of that hierarchization is certainly up for discussion, but it is, I think, inevitably going to be there, precisely because these categories didn't always exist. So it would be naive to think that they just, when they do pop into fruition, that they're just neutral, that they have no grounding in some sort of framework, even if their very establishment is in this just neutral, the plane in which it resides, or the the form in which it takes that of order, that of taxonomy or whatever, is housed within a broader systemic logic of um, oppression. Or oppre oppression may not be the best word, but I, I, maybe violence would be better. Where we do things a certain disservice when we when we classify them and close them off of their possibility, right? And you know, I think of Deleuze and Guattari for that one, but what is necessarily going on with that sort of turn into language in the 18th century a la Foucault? So Baudrillard then takes this opportunity to think about Foucault, where he says specifically that, you know, Foucault was thinking about the mad, or mad men, at the dawn of Western modernity, and how they were, you know, shoved in asylums and whatnot, kind of made to be normal, in air quotes. Um, he says that the, Baudrillard says that the poor, the underdeveloped, those with subnormal IQs, whatever that means, perverts, transsexuals, intellectuals, and women from a folklore of terror, a folklore of excommunication on the basis of an increasingly racist definition of the normal human. Quintess quintessence of normality, ultimately all these categories will be excluded, segregated, exiled, in a finally universal society, where the normal and the universal will at last fuse under the sign of the human. So again, you know, we're not just thinking about Foucault in terms of madness and civilization of the birth of the clinic, we're very much thinking about the uh, Foucault who thinks about structure, the Foucault who thinks about subjectivity, and how did these things come into fruition? Under what ages did these structures form? But what is more important for Baudrillard, well, it'd be wrong to say that, uh, for Baudrillard, Foucault missed something, and it goes as follows. At the very core of the rationality of our culture, however, is an exclusion that precedes every other, more radical than the exclusion of madmen, children, or inferior races, an exclusion preceding all these and serving as their model, the exclusion of the dead and of death, hence the title. So at one time for Baudrillard, death had a certain uh, symbolic and economic function in a sense, where I use the term economic rather loosely. Take the uh, example of sacrifice where death did not mark necessarily an end, but death was something that had, you know, uh, that propelled society, culture forward, that allowed for a certain development to occur. Whereas today, 
something has shifted, where Baudrillard says that it is not normal to be dead, which is very interesting, where death um, marks a certain finality. And in effect, you know, it's very um, clear that we would be afraid of it then, because it's, you know, keeping all kind of doxological analyses aside or, or praises aside, let's assume that death is just an end. There's no afterlife or anything like that. Uh, it, it would not need to house such a potential, in fact, for Baudrillard to actually be something meaningful. Death can work even if it does mark a total end, precisely in the, the example of sacrifice or any other form of that, or any form that that can necessarily take. So as Baudrillard stated earlier, where, like in the case of factories that no longer exist because labor is everywhere, or prisons no longer exist because we've sort of, we realize this sort of Foucauldian carceral state, uh, Baudrillard suggests the cemetery itself no longer exists because modern cities have entirely taken over the fu their function. They are ghost towns, cities of death. If the great operational metropolis is the final form of an entire culture, then quite simply, ours is a culture of death. Now this is a very interesting claim, because if we probe him a little bit, we'd say, okay, well, what are the conditions that make death, uh, that realize death under these conditions? Sorry. How could we then characterize death? I think to, you know, try to fill in the blanks here, Humans have, for Baudrillard, a very specific biological function, or two specific biological functions that are unchanging, which is very problematic. And they're, they're things that we can certainly take them to task for, precisely because we think of them as the thinker of no truth or anything like that. But if we humor him for a second here, um, there is life and then there's death. And those things are absolutely true. If we exercise or if we conjure away one of those, we... No longer, no longer cease to be human. Now, this is very, this is a very, very important idea for Baudrillard's later work, precisely because we, he begins to think of like what kind of uh, system have we conjured away or have we uh, put in place instead of what preceded it. I'm, I'm refraining from giving them names now because, you know, let's leave some suspense here. But in this case, death occurs, and he says that it's located in the city, precisely because death doesn't exist as it once did, where death is stripped of its value. Death marks an end, there is no meaning left to it, yada yada yada. What that effectively results in for Baudrillard is that loss of the human, a kind of perpetual death. So the concept of immortality then for Baudrillard grew alongside the segregation of the, of the dead. Now, I want to take a moment to think about this in relation to Hannah Arendt and the human condition, where in that, uh, Hannah Arendt thinks about immortality as being something, a condition sort of made possible by the existence of a, of a political sphere or a public sphere, polis, anything like that, where people can engage in dialogue, can be great, if you will, whereas she says in the social or in the, I guess, dissipation of the split between the public and the private, um, we have made, quote, excellence anonymous. So immortality is possible in the case of Arendt. And I'm going to link this back to Baudrillard in a moment. Immortality is possible in the case of Arendt, not necessarily by having a longer life, but precisely by having one's I guess, essence, one's identity, extend throughout time and space. So what that, what we have done now, precisely because I think that Baudrillard and Arendt can be read side by side very comfortably, um, what we have then is a giant compensatory, compensatory compensation machine at work here. I feel like I just made up a word, but moving on. A giant compensation machine that instead where instead of trying to um, reintroduce a sort of political system that would allow people to engage with one another to kind of allow a sort of fame to occur that transcends the you know Hollywood type idea of fame but that in more accordance with the Greek idea 
and I know how wrong it is to romanticize this this shit, but I'm I'm gonna say it anyways. <laughs> um, instead of that, what we have is a development in, you know, health sciences, biopolitics, any of these things that are focused on extending life. It's just a giant compensation for our loss of immortality in what I will call a symbolic way, or in the, a political way, to be, to think uh, in terms of our end here. So this is one of those kind of simulatory type things. Or rather, thinking back to the mirror of production, it really corresponds to the logic of the code, where there is a kind of scientific apparatus, one that, you know, claims to drive towards these fundamental truths, that replace any possible illusion, kind of foreclose the possibility of change or whatever. Um, science comes to do this, but it is really just, in the case of the extension of life, where, you know, people are living longer and longer every year, on average. We're not including those, those marginalized groups or those impoverished groups, but, <laughs> but just on average in the, you know, first world countries, uh, all this is simply a response to a loss of meaning, if you will. It's, it's a strategy employed by a bankrupt culture that is incapable of engaging in the Arendtian sense sort of meaningfully with one another to allow for excellence to arise. You know, I am fully cognizant of how problematic these terms are, but um, I just use this example because it, help, it, it at least helps me kind of understand what Baudrillard is why Baudrillard is interested in death here. So for Baudrillard, it is from this exorcism of death that power becomes possible. Where he says that power is possible only if death is no longer free. Only if the dead are put under surveillance in anticipation of the future confinement of life in its entirety. Whereas Baudrillard, you know, very romantically kind of thinks that there's... Um, a liberatory potential behind death, behind death as being um, part of exchange, part of value, part of meaning. If that was possible, then you know people wouldn't have the same kind of reservations about dying, about death, as he believes they currently do. Imagine, you know, this the possibility of an army of people not not afraid of of death, right? Of course. There are ways that that is kind of made manifest now, precisely by dehumanizing people. But Baudrillard wants to think about it not in those terms, but as they're having there being like a true meaning behind death that doesn't require a sort of, you know, breaking people down to the point of not caring about their lives, but this coming about in another way, in an optimistic way. So death has been made. Um, to correspond to a certain biological logic, biological logic, sort of bios. It has been given uh, an identity, a sort of materialist identity that locates it solely within the realm of things, of nature, of the world, that doesn't, has no possibility for transcendence. And I use that term with some reservation, but I just want to think about it in terms of like a connection to the gods, per se, a connection to uh, the cosmos, anything like that. It has been stripped of it precisely because it has been given a sort of, you know, a, a materialist tinge. So Baudrillard then thinks about this in relation to the death drive, where he sees in Freud both an opportunity and a foreclosure of, of that very opportunity. For Baudrillard doesn't want to normalize the death drive to suggest that it's something that's like innate or something that can be made um, manifest in like the physical world. But he wants it to remain, retain something of an ambiguity. So he says then, um, Freud's thought acts fundamentally as the death drive in the Western theoretical universe. But then, of course, it is absurd to give it, uh, to give it the constructive status of truth. The reality of the death drive is indefensible. To remain faithful to the institution of intuition of the death drive, it must remain a deconstructive hypothesis. That is, it must be adopted solely within the limits of the deconstruction that it carries out on all prior thought. As a concept, however, 
it too must be immediately deconstructed. We cannot think, other than as the ultimate subterfuge of reason, that the principle of deconstruction is all that escapes it. So the death drive must be uh, maintained as a sort of ambiguous phenomenon. It must be something that, you know, doesn't necessarily touch the reality principle per se, or whatever. Um, it can simply be embedded within a Freudian framework of, you know, the Nirvana principle, the reality principle, the pleasure principle, or Eros and Thanatos, but is actually something that, that cuts across all those. That is something that is simultaneously within it and without of it. So for this reason, the death drive must be defended against every attempt to re-dialecticize it into a new constructive edifice. So, in this case, Marcuse is a good example. Concerning repression through death, he writes, that is Marcuse, theology and philosophy today compete with each other in celebrating death as an existential category, perverting a biological fact into an ontological essence. They bestow transcendental blessing on the guilt of mankind which they help to perpetuate. Thus, it is for surplus uh, uh, repression. So what Bozier doesn't want to do is kind of think about death as, as having these kind of sublimatory um, manifestations in the form of the death drive or the natos or anything like that, where that would, for Bozier, would kind of localize it within a biological function to say that it, you know, there hasn't actually been an assault on it or it hasn't actually been fully exercised. You know, and Baudrillard wouldn't be one to necessarily say it has fully disappeared, but he doesn't want to think of it as always having always already been there and re something that remains. But he really wants to think about it and criticize it and perform a sort of uh, deconstructive analysis of the eros the Natos type split and how they, they operate within one another, not only to affirm one another, but to perpetuate a certain myth that death hasn't been uh, conjured away. Or that, you know, there is such a thing as desire that all kind of return to this biological finality. One that uh, lays down the possibility, kind of constructs a certain uh, human capability, not based on some kind of um, biological imperative, but precisely as a consequence of a certain, um, you know, epistemic shift towards these, these taxonomic ideas pertaining to biology, life, life sciences, natural history of these things. So Baudrillard doesn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater per se, where he sees in the death drive still a certain ambiguity, something that can't be codified, something that can't be grasped, uh, precisely because he says that the death drive is irritating, because it does not allow of any dialectical recovery. This is where its radicalism lies. So at one time, as I just mentioned, there is uh, within the death drive a, so a sort of um, uh, biologization, I think I made up a word there, but whatever, of death being located within the body. But then at the same time, there is a, there's a great deal of mystery, that it is, it is shrouded in a great deal of mystery. That is something that we must uh, still recognize. And then he, he says something, um, he says something funny here about, about Engels, about the, um, he, he says that why then all Freud's efforts to ground the death drive in biological rationality question mark, and says that this positivist effort is generally deplored, a little like Engels' attempt to dialecti dialecticize nature that we agree to ignore out of affection for him. But it's an important important point in relation to Freud. The Engels thing is just funny. Uh, it, of Freud trying to enter it into this biological rationality is to do the death drive a disservice, or to do death a disservice. Because it's not supposed to correspond to some sort of logic, some sort of rationality per se. And that is exactly what, where its potential lies. In, in value and exchange and meaning, these things can't exist within death, precisely because death, to embody those, ironically, it must have some sort of connection with the unknown. That is, the cosmos, the gods, or whatever. So in, in response to Freud, Baudrillard then thinks, or thinks about Bataille as being a thinker that opens up the domain for a certain uh, analysis that challenges you know, political economy at its core, and that can shatter uh, the, even the mirror of political economy. 
Um, but he, to, to kind of sidestep the relationship, or to sidestep, to kind of take this aside for a moment, Bojard's relationship to Batai, I don't know what their personal relationship was like, um, but Bojard, there's a critique, uh, Bojard critiqued Batai um, pretty strongly, and it was pretty recently, I think it was in the 2000s, and you can find this online, it was, it's called, wait, let me show it. Right, it was called, it's called when Bataille attacked the metaphysical principle of economy. So, what Baudrillard says, um, you know, to really paraphrase this, and it's really short, it's only a few pages, like three pages or four pages or something. Um, Baudrillard says of Bataille that Bataille, even in his, what I will come to say in relation to symbolic exchange and death in Freud, is that Bataille does open the door for a sort of radical analysis. But what Bataille ultimately misses is that there isn't like an ultimate source of potential or potentiation from the sun, from la partie maudite, or la pas maudite, or the uh, cursed share, or however that, that's translated. In, uh, I think there might be other translations of that. Um, no matter what any of these sources are, uh, Baudrillard suggests that Bataille misses that these things don't just exist. And he gives the example of the Aztecs, where the sun is not something that is just this ultimate giver. The sun has to be compensated in the form of sacrifice. It has to be uh, defied. And this is, there's, there's a translation thing, or it's not really an issue or thing, but Baudrillard often uses the term defié to... Um, to uh, illustrate the sort of engagement between people and gods in the form of the sacrifice. So the direct translation would be just to defy. But it's often translated as challenge, which makes sense. I think with defy, though, there is the implication that there is some, some kind of, they are successful at doing it. If you defy someone, the task is done. Whereas if you challenge someone... Right, the outcome is still up in the air. But that's it's not that not that important. Um, but what what Baudrillard says is that a, a Bataille essentially fails to think about symbolic exchange. Doesn't think about sacrifice. You know, it's kind of like saying you didn't think about it in my way, so you're obviously wrong. Um, but I think it's interesting, nevertheless, especially as in back to symbolic exchange and death. Um, Baudrillard speaks rather highly of Bataille, where he says that something remains in Bataille's excessive and luxuriant vision of death that removes it from psychoanalysis and its individual and psychical domain. So, uh, this something provides the opportunity to disturb every economy, shattering not only the objective mirror of political economy, but also the inverse psychical mirror of repression. So I think that that's very much possible. You know, we think of the accursed share or what, like, kind of remains on the the bed sheets after, you know, intercourse, like the the just the residue, you know, the the filth. Uh, these things don't fit in the realm of political economy, especially how political economy, thinking back to the mirror of production, is related to these, you know, high this high humanist logic of rationality or whatever. How the you know the bare bones parts of life, the shitty parts, if you will, they really challenge and take to task our holding dear these kind of high this high humanist creed. So whereas with the primitives, that messed up term, um, every death is social, public, and collective, and it is always the effect of an adversarial will that the group must absorb. In brackets, no biology. So thinking again of that term defier or to challenge. Um, as having a sort of, playing a sort of, a, a role in death, where death is not, doesn't mark an end, but death actually exists as a, a social, public, and collective institution, and works within those things. So this sort of extradition of death plays a very fundamental role in the solidification and the consolidation of this idea of the human. So we return, I guess, full circle to this idea of um, this sort of taxonomic split, 
these these taxonomies established very broad taxonomies where you have human animal you know trees then nature very very broad things but Baudrillard thinks about this in relation specifically to humans and animals whereas we are so afraid of losing the status of, hu of, of the human that we have you know very much um, located within the realm or we are very much consolidated through the extradition of death that we ver we fear a certain contact with 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 otherness hence like this development of racism um the um i guess the complete and total you know um eradication of otherness but in the case of animals Baudrillard asks but why this revulsion at seeing an animal treated like a human being to which he answers because then man changes into a beast in the hanged animal and this is uh he arrived at this point by thinking about well if we have this thing called the death penalty why does it not ex why does it not extend onto the realm of other beings why don't other beings have this thing called the death penalty and if we were going to hold it so dear you know to be properly humanitarian or to be properly egalitarian or um egalitarian how many how many etarians can i throw in here egalitarian about it this is um, a con consequence that should befall other beings as well animal human or otherwise but baudrillard says that in the case of uh seeing animals treated like humans so because then man changes into a beast in the hanged man hanged animal there is by way of the sign and the ritual, a hanged man, but a man changed into a beast, as if by black magic. So this is, you know, very, very problematic, this, this example. But it's interesting because it makes us, I think it forces us to think about this sort of privileging of the human perspective. Where we have, you know, keeping, um, keeping consistent with this discourse around death, think of the death penalty, surely is some kind of manifestation of that. Um, why is it that the, you know, the, uh, the, the death penalty is limited to humans then? If, you know, it's just kind of revealing the irony behind it. Like, well, why do we have this thing? And of course it's starting to, at least in like the West, it's starting to go away slowly. <laughs> you know, I hope. But it's interesting to think about in these terms precisely because it throws our idea of humanity out of whack. So our kind of um, lack of tolerance for otherness uh, is made manifest in this case of the animal, where Baudrillard says that disgust is, disgust is inspired in us by the execution of an animal in exact proportion to the contempt in which we hold it, precisely in this privileging of the human perspective, where we have this institution that is the death drive, or the, death, the death penalty, Death drive being an institution as well, but we have the the death penalty, and we believe that there are no other beings that because when we think that they can't other beings that is animals can't experience that, then we are you know privileging ourselves, we're, we're rendering it an esoteric phenomenon that makes us fear the possibility of becoming like. The animal because if we extend our institutions onto them then word is you know we're, we will surely see the blurring of the distinction between human and animal so it is then insofar as it as as is proper to our culture as we relegate the animal to a non-human state of irresponsibility that the animal becomes unworthy of the human ritual all we all we need then all we need then do is apply this ritual to the animal to make, our, to make us nauseous, not because of some moral progress, but because of the deepening of human racism. And this is important if we think back to the discussion about sacrifice, or the role that animals played in that, where there was a respect held for the animal in... And again, I don't want to homogenize like all sacrificial acts. You know, there are, some really, there are many that still occur that I don't think... Um, are worthy of such an analysis, but we are romanticizing here. Um, animals have kind of lost that same potential as humans have in the in the name of sacrifice or in in the example of sacrifice. 
where death doesn't mark like a total end per se. So in effect, we, we just as we infantilize humans, especially others that don't fall into the uh, broad rationalistic categories of like this high humanistic uh, logic, like that, we infantilize animals, where we say that animals do not, we, we make the decision for them. We say that, no, it is wrong to do this to an animal, yet, you know, in the same token, we have, you know, um, factory farms or animal farms or the um, animal farming where animals live in deplorable conditions where they're left to die having extracted everything from their living beings not being able to participate in death they don't serve a function in death and are therefore useless our treatment of animals in that way very much mirrors our treatment of ourselves our treatment of other humans especially um, in relation to this this humanistic logic, this kind of privileging of you know the Eurocentric notions of being, where others are just simply excommunicated, where we strip them, we strip them and ourselves of the radical potential that lies in death, that lies in ritual, that lies in ceremony, all these things that have been you know given away under the weight of factory farming, you know, death camps, all these sorts of institutions that render death obsolete, that make people all that they can give in their living state and just thrown in giant pits made to be non, non-beings, if you will. Not because they are unproductive when they're alive, but precisely because that they their death is not appreciated, or their death doesn't hold any value, which is where I think Baudrillard is, how he wants to think about death here, how he wants to, you know, think about death as being something that is meaningful, and how that meaning is being, you know, taken away through these simulating machines, you know, not indicative of, like, technology or simulation as we might think of it, even though there is a discussion to be had about how, you know, the current CGI effects of, like, dead actors and actresses or whatever um, certainly questions our relationship to death right where for take the uh, Star Wars examples there were probably earlier ones but that's like the first one that comes to my head where certain actors from the original trilogy are CGI'd into these ones now for 99% of the people that had a relationship that is the viewers with those actors that relationship is still retained precisely because it was a simulated one through the screen, right? And I don't want to downplay that sort of relationship. It could have meaning or whatever, like the Princess Leia thing. Um, but it certainly demands that we question, at least thinking about these, this thing as a contemporary, contemporary type phenomenon, or at least the role that that plays, uh, how our relationship to death is, is, should be <laughs> questioned greatly because of that. But thinking before that, how these uh, simulating machines indicative of, you know, industrial terror, if you will, or the, you know, development of these technologies of death, really mess up what it means to be alive. Because you are made productive totally by your being, not by your non-being, not by your death. So Baudrillard then does something interesting. He, he thinks he thinks about this in political terms, where on one side, you know, and this was written in the mid seventies. Uh, on one side, you have the right that you know very much in favor of this idea of the death penalty, and the left very much in very much in favor of this idea of uh, institutionalization or rehabilitation or anything like this. So what he says is that uh, both speak the same medical language. That is the right and the left. Remove a diseased member, says the right. Cure a sick organ, says the left. So in either case, we, we see a sort of death occurring, where there is that kind of physical death. You are, you are no longer being. Uh, you no longer hold any sort of stakes in the general economy. And on the other side, in the sort of rehabilitation method, uh, model, one indicative of the Foucauldian analysis, what you see is a death of, of the person as who they are, 
right? Because we have a very, we have a codified system, this kind of carceral state that see, wants people to act a certain way, you know, you, in order to, you know, be effective, you must act like this and do this and at these times and wake up at this hour and make your bed in the morning, like they, these arbitrary type, type things, but that hold a certain meaning in this, this cultural context. Baudrillard says that there is a form of death that exists in both. Whereas, you know, he, he for him, that's why, in a sense, these the political solutions at the time were not satisfactory to him. Because they were both on the side of death. They were both on the side of the contemporary form of death. That is, the death that didn't hold any sway. The death that was that uh, rendered people obsolete. So this is why there is a sort of radicality located in death today. Because Baudrillard doesn't want to... And, and, and this is why he's so, he's so difficult. Because he doesn't want to totalize death and say that there's nothing that can be done. Because he goes on to say that every death and all violence that escapes state monopoly is subversive. It is a prefiguration of the abolition of power. So, in the most extreme example, something like suicide, that doesn't abide by a certain state logic, that doesn't, is a death that is of one's own accord, uh, one's own accord um, it challenges, in this case, the term uses the state monopoly over death, it challenges that by giving death a meaning specific to the person doing it, right? And this is by no means, you know, um, for, for me here, a, uh, you know, a promotion of suicide in any way. I think that that's a very much um, a naive and violent thing to say. But the point that Baudrillard is trying to make is that he fears more a state that controls every death, that houses every death in hospitals, in, you know, asylums, prisons, than the possibility of people being able to commit suicide, where that is something for him that says, okay, there's still a potential. And he gives an example similar to this in relation to terrorism in Fatal Strategies, which we'll get to at some point, I'm hoping to move away from Baudrillard for a little while, but he always he has a gravitational pull. But he says in Fatal Strategies in relation to terrorism that he fears more a state capable of eradicating terrorism than terrorism itself, where he would see that as being the eradication of all difference, the eradication of all subversion, the eradication, the eradication of possibility. And he thinks about this in the same way as death, where in the case of suicide, it's not as though we are returning to the symbolic logic of death. But it is that death is not is um, taken from the hands of this state apparatus, which in itself is, a, is a, I will say, a whole new domain, but one that is subversive nevertheless. So it is in the sense that Baudrillard, he, he concludes his um, the chapter, he, he says that death itself demands to be experienced immediately in total blindness and total ambivalence. But is it revolutionary, he asks. If political economy is the most rigorous attempt to put an end to death, it is clear that only death can put an end to political economy. And that is because for him, take uh, he, he gives the example of sex in, um, in relation to death. Where he says that sex was believed to be, you know, that kind of emancipatory uh, institution, right, uh, via the you know, Marcusean type analyses. But he says that sex is legal. Sex is something that has been entered into the political domain, entered into the economy, whereas death is still illegal, right? Suicide is something that, you know, we, we ward off with all our institutional power, right? It's something that must be corrected. It must be made non-existent. So it's for that reason Baudrillard sees a certain radicality behind it. So the next chapter I, I have a lot of trouble grappling with because it's dealing with Sassoul and the anagram and I am not all that familiar with that. But the, the point that Baudrillard is trying to make is that, or that he makes here, is, is that language um, 
relies to a certain extent on speech so as so so as to allow its disappearance, right? So behind speech or parole exists and there's an interesting moment here because long language, um, so in French there's the split between long and parole, and that would be in, in English that'd be like speech and language. Uh, but it's very interesting because there's a moment in this when the term code is used. So the code is what uh, exists before um, uh, before speech, but in brackets, they, uh, the translator wrote the original word being long. So to think about the code in that term in those terms is really interesting to me. Think about it to think about it as language. But what you know what he's doing here is he's really try he's just doing the Foucauldian thing in the order of things. He he's just thinking about you know the development of from representation to language to speech. Uh, why is it that language developed? Why is it that speech developed? Why is it that, you know, um, uh, uh, representation developed? So he, th he thinks about language in the same kind of terms as he thinks about death, science, modernity, rationality, where he says that this is what linguistics does. It forces language into an autonomous sphere in its own image and feigns to have found it there objectively when, from start to finish, it invented and rationalized it. It is incapable of imagining a state of language other than that of the combinatory abstraction of the code. This is where, in brackets, we find the word long. Accompanied with an infinite manipulation of speech, in brackets, parole. In other words, speculation, in the double sense of the term, on the basis of general equivalence and free circulation, everyone using words they please and exchanging them in accordance with the law of the code. So there is that, that foreclosure, that kind of possibility. Um, same thing in like Deleuze, when we think of, um, God, Thousand Plateaus, what was that title called? The un, the unlinguistic one. Um, but that, that kind of closing off, right? Kind of uh, placing language under the umbrella of this scientific equivalent within language that is linguistics, right? Giving it these um, properties that can be located um, identified, made, you know, to enter the taxonomic arena. Again, Foucault does this a million times better in the order of things, and it's, uh, like, he, he really traces it much more effectively, and this is very much the same. But uh, there's, in this chapter, he, uh, Baudrillard gives, um, tells a story, an Arthur C. Clarke story called The Nine Billion Names of God, which is kind of what, what, what I want to focus on here. So this story, The Nine Billion Names of God, is, um, I'll just read the Baudrillard synopsis here, uh, is a science fiction story where a brotherhood of llamas lost in the foothills of Tibet devote their whole lives to the rec recitation of the names of God. There are a great many of these names, nine billion. When they have all been stated and declined, the world will come to an end, an entire cycle of the world bringing the world to an end step by step, word by word, by exhausting the total corpus of the signifiers of God. This is their religious delirium, or the truth of their death drive. So what then happens is that IBM shows up with this, with this machine, uh, this computer that would speed up, kind of catalyze their task, and then just in a few days it is able to account for all nine billion names of God, uh, at which point the stars start to fade and then the world uh, the world starts to disappear, right? That 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 is the that is the story. Now, the what I like to extract from this, or th how I like to think about this in relation to the whole project here that Baudrillard is getting at, and then specifically I'll talk about the the linguistic stuff, um, is that um, how is is how a sort of symbolic location or symbolic mode of being is challenged by these scientific endeavors. How they accelerate things to their end point, how they make things, uh, they force things into fruition and through that coming into being in that sort of form, because it's not like a, a natural coming into being, but a, but a forced one predicated on the, the rationality of these scientific endeavors, uh, actually accelerates us towards that end of the world, right? which we could say has already, already occurred.
it, it has occurred with the extradition of death. So Baudrillard sees this happening with like linguistics as well. Where linguistics serves that kind of uh, function in relation to language, where it gives language a certain meaning by locating the structures behind it. It says that there is this history to language. Language has come into fruition because of X, Y, and Z, and that's why we have it at this point. And any sort of attempts to digress from that, take for instance the, you know, the discussion now around like pronoun usage, in um, in, in the West, uh, and how you know using they as a as a singular uh, term, which is a ridiculous idea. But um, anyways, what we see there is the foreclosure of that sort of possibility, right? We don't like it when language develops that is outside of the purview of this kind of naturalized system, the his, this historical system, right? And like Foucault says in The Order of Things, the development of a natural history did not occur when nature was given like, um, was kind of given a, a telos or given a kind of linearity, but it was at the moment that history itself became natural when history was the thing that stood as that kind of ultimate reference. Whereas this kind of unchanging thing, uh, the same can be said of linguistics here, that, that stops the possibility of um, that development that can extend beyond the clutches of, you know, the scientific kind of linguistic parameters set forth, if we can even say these things exist. But... I'm just going off of the people that say that these so-called structures do exist. So one example of a challenge to this uh, is, is with Harpo Marx. So the Marx Brothers, um, we think of films like uh, Duck Soup, and other ones are evading me, but the kind of slapsticky type humor, where Baudrillard writes that when Harpo Marx waves a real sturgeon instead of pronouncing the password sturgeon to like a door, a door person, uh, then indeed, by substituting the referent of the term and by abolishing their separation, he really explodes the arbitrariness at the same time as the system of representation in a poetic act par, par excellence, putting the signifier surge into death by its own referent. So in that sort of playful reversal, in that sort of, I guess, playful uh, form of resistance, um, Baudrillard uses this example, or sees in this example, a challenge to the finality associated with the, the linguistic turn, kind of like the one that Foucault identifies in the order of things. I know I sound like a broken record, but I, I like Foucault a lot too. Um, but with that being said, uh, Baudrillard does romanticize here this idea of the, the kind of poetic, right? The poetic is that which exists simultaneously outside of linguistics or language as it, as it has been established by linguistics, how it has been promoted by it, kind of given its ethos, and instead enters into a playful form that is arbitrary, that, that moves off into, uh, you know, un, untraversed territory, places that are outside of the reach of the kind of the scientific compartmentalization, you know, teleonomic type uh, drive of those institutions. So of this... And he says that concerning the poetic, or in brackets, the work of art, the symbolic and, in brackets, primitive anthropology, neither Marx nor Freud has been able to say anything unless either has reduced it to a mode of production on the one hand and to repression and castration on the other. When psychoanalysis and Marxism come to grief, we must not want to have them fall like angels or like beasts. They must be pitilessly analyzed according to their failures and omissions, Today, the limits of each are the strategic points of every revolutionary analysis. And I think, I think it's interesting, especially the way we think about uh, Marx in relation to the mirror of production or how Baudrillard talks about it there, where desire, where such things are made productive, where, you know, the Marxist dream simply makes productive those forces that are supposed to exist outside of political economy effectively bringing them back into it. So what Baudrillard wants to do, and this is where I heavily resist against people who say that, you know, Baudrillard's cynic, he doesn't believe that there's any possibility of resistance, 
you know, I say that, no, in fact, he was a very optimistic thinker. He really wanted to think of a way that would to challenge these, um, this sort of finality. And play, poetry, graffiti, these are all examples of things that move beyond political economy, that are just in service of existing for the sake of whatever, like not in the service of a certain economic system. So he concludes the book then with, with a call for this kind of, for, for a radical theory that accounts for this, where he says that a radical theory can be neither based on their synthesis nor their contamination, but only on their respective extermination. Marxism and psychoanalysis are in crisis. Rather than supporting one another, their respective crises must be telescoped and speeded up. They must yet do each other great collateral damage. We must not be deprived of this spectacle. They are only critical fields. In other words, they don't, just because they mirror the same things that they challenge, at least according to Baudrillard, you know, the hardcore Marxist thinkers and, and psychoanalytic thinkers would take him to task on that for sure, and they definitely should. But it's, it's something that we must, I think, at least consider. So it's on that note, you know, we've gotten through symbolic exchange and death here, and it really is a, it's a beast. It's, it's a, there's a lot here. And I only scraped the surface. I tried to give like a, a, a fair amount of analysis, but I, you know, it would take you know a, a full year-long course just to like kind of get at what's going on here, or a semester maybe. But you know, I really hope that if anyone listened this, this through all these videos, um, that I've, that I've read this and see problems with what I have suggested, I really hope that you would tell me because I'm, I'm st I still struggle a lot with these ideas and I really don't want to come off as someone that claims to know it well. Like I've, I've read this book twice now and it still makes no sense to me. Um, but really, for anyone that made it this far, thank you for listening. Uh, and like I just said, if you have any comments, concerns, questions, please leave it, you know how to, uh, but for now, take it easy.